China launches another lunar relay satellite, and Northrop Grumman is studying a lunar railroad? Plus, SpaceX finally debuts its crew tower at the Cape and launches quite a shady Starlink mission. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 22nd of March, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. Let's start off by taking a look at This Week in Launches. Starting off the week, we had the launch of a Falcon 9 carrying another batch of Starlink satellites. Liftoff took place on March 16th at 21 minutes past midnight UTC from Launch Complex 39A in Florida. The 23 Starlink V2 mini satellites on board were successfully inserted into their low Earth orbit just one hour after launch. And as is customary, the first stage of this Falcon 9 was flight proven. Booster B-1062 was flying for a 19th time, becoming one of the flight leaders of the fleet and matching the current record for maximum number of flights of a Falcon 9 booster. It successfully returned back to Earth, landing on SpaceX's drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas. Later in the week, we had another Falcon 9 launch taking place on March 19th at 2.28 UTC from Space Launch Complex 4 East in Vandenberg. The mission was another Starlink flight, but this one was a bit more peculiar than usual. Prior to launch, SpaceX indicated that 22 Starlink satellites were flying on this mission, but it only reported 20 to satellite tracking sites like Celestrack. These sites get direct information from the SpaceX Starlink teams about where and how many Starlink satellites are being launched well before the mission takes place. With this information, other satellite operators can know when and where to move their spacecraft to avoid the satellites if needed. So obviously, seeing sites like these report fewer satellites than SpaceX had claimed was already kind of interesting. Another observation from this pre-launch information was that the orbit was higher, about 20 kilometers above the usual. The reference to 22 satellites was also later removed from the website, and SpaceX never indicated again how many satellites were flying on the mission. It also didn't help that they didn't show any views of the payload stack like in past Starlink missions. It certainly is a bit head-scratching. We'll have to see whether SpaceX sneaked in a couple of extra satellites that weren't supposed to be announced. Perhaps they're Starshield satellites. But in any case, if there are any future updates, we'll surely bring them to you here in a future episode of This Week in Spaceflight. But before going into the next launch, let's not forget about the booster. The first stage for this mission, B-1075, was flying for a 10th time, becoming the 14th booster to reach this mark. <laughs> Remember when 10 flights was a big deal? <laughs> Kinda crazy that we're at this point now. But as usual, it returned back to Earth, landing on SpaceX's drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You. Now, moving to the other side of the world, we had the launch of a Chongzhong 8 rocket on March 20th at 31 minutes past midnight UTC from the Wenchang Space Launch Site in China. The mission was carrying the Chiachao 2 satellite and two other rideshares into a translunar injection. This satellite is China's latest lunar communications relay satellite and a successor to the Chiachao 1 satellite launched back in 2018. That satellite was launched ahead of the Chang'e 4 mission, which landed the first spacecraft on the far side of the moon, hence the need for a relay satellite. Just like then, Chiachao 2 is being launched ahead of the upcoming Chang'e 6 mission, which will again attempt to land on the far side of the moon. But unlike the Chang'e 4 mission, this mission will also launch from the moon, bringing samples back to Earth from the far side of our celestial neighbor. While a successor to that first relay satellite, it's certainly not the same. This second satellite has a larger bus with more power, more propellant, and is overall a much more capable spacecraft. The Chiachao 2 satellite is also going into a different, more highly elliptical orbit around the moon than the previous one, which went to the Earth-Moon L2 Lagrange point. This will allow this newest relay to be used in the future for additional lunar missions in China's exploration programs, including as a potential relay for future missions to the moon by humans. Along for the ride on this mission were the Tiandu 1 and 2 small satellites, which will be testing navigation and inter-satellite communication in cislunar space. Also from China this week, we had the launch of a Chongzheng 2D rocket with a Yuanzheng 3 upper stage. Liftoff took place on March 21st at 5.27 UTC from the South Launch Site 2 at the Chen Satellite Launch Center. The rocket was carrying six Yunhai-2 satellites into low Earth orbit. The Yunhai-2 satellites are a set of military meteorological satellites that use radio occultation to collect atmospheric data used in weather forecasting. This is the second batch of Yunhai-2 satellites being launched, with the previous one having been launched in 2018. 
This week we also had the launch of Rocket Lab's Electron rocket, but this time from the United States. Liftoff took place on March 21st at 7.25 UTC from the Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. The mission, called Live and Let Fly, was carrying the NROL-123 payload for the National Reconnaissance Office. Because it was a classified mission, we don't know much other than that it likely went into a low Earth orbit at around 47 degrees orbital inclination. Also from the US, we had the launch of another Falcon 9, but this time with a dragon on top. Liftoff of the CRS-30 mission took place on March 21st at 2055 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The mission was carrying SpaceX's 30th resupply mission to the International Space Station. This was the first time a Dragon 2 spacecraft launched from this pad, and the first time in four years that any Dragon has launched from Slick 40 at all. The launch pad has been upgraded in the last year with the addition of a crew access tower and arm to allow the load of cargo and people on board the Dragon 2 spacecraft. SpaceX also installed a pad egress system, which consists of a slide that should evacuate the crew and pad teams to safety should an emergency occur before the activation of the capsule's onboard escape system. And I gotta say, that slide looks like a lot of fun. With this cargo dragon now finally trying out all of the new infrastructure at Slick 40, a crew mission from here could happen sometime later this year. Now, coming back to what this mission was all about, Dragon is now headed toward the station, and it's carrying 2,841 kilograms of cargo that will be unloaded over the next several weeks. The spacecraft is set to dock to the Zenith port on the ISS Harmony module on March 23rd at 11.30 UTC, and will remain on the station for the next month or so. This is this particular capsule's fourth trip to space, having previously supported the CRS-22, CRS-24, and CRS-27 missions. The first stage was also flight proven, flying for a sixth time on this mission. It successfully returned back on land at SpaceX's landing zone one, sending sonic booms all across the space coast. Well, now it's time to talk about money, but not in a good way. NASA has received the president's budget proposal for fiscal year 2025, and let's just say that there are some changes coming. This budget proposal requests an overall $25.4 billion, which is $500 million more than what NASA was allocated in fiscal year 2024. But it's also the same amount of money that was allocated to the agency during fiscal year 2023, which essentially means that the budget would be pretty much flat for about three years straight. The agency had hoped to see its budget increase in 2024 and 2025 to more than $27 billion, but according to NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, the non-defense discretionary spending caps imposed by Congress are what have essentially made the agency try to keep its budget flat for the time being. So besides all of that budget drama, what's this proposal all about and what are the consequences? Well, for Artemis fans, there's some good news, and it's that at least Artemis is being fully funded. It's not as much money as the agency had hoped in earlier years, but it's good enough to fund the near future projects. However, the funding outlook for later years means that the Artemis V mission, which was previously scheduled for September of 2029, has been pushed back to March of 2030. The agency also expects to spend about $500 million less on Orion and SLS over the next year, as both vehicles are leaving the development phase and entering into the operations phases of their respective programs. However, when looking elsewhere in the proposal, there are going to also be some budget cuts. For example, the agency is canceling the Geospace Dynamics Constellation, a heliophysics project, and restructuring and splitting certain Earth observation programs. The agency would also see a decrease in the money allocated to the Commercial LEO Destinations Program to help set up commercial space stations in low Earth orbit before the end of the decade. One key program that's also seeing a reduction in funding will be the Chandra X-ray Observatory. The budget proposal would request only two-thirds of the budget allocated for the observatory in 2024, and then projects funding for its operations to fall by the end of the decade. NASA claims that, quote, the Chandra spacecraft has been degrading over its mission lifetime to the extent that several systems require active management to keep temperatures within acceptable ranges for spacecraft operations. This has brought some criticism from the community, including astronomer Jonathan McDowell, who marks it as the end of U.S. excellence in X-ray astronomy. 
A campaign has even been set up online to save the observatory from eventual cancellation. Chandra was the third of NASA's original Great Observatories, an unofficial program of four large satellites observing in different wavelengths. You had the Hubble Space Telescope observing in ultraviolet, optical, and near-infrared wavelengths, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory for the study of gamma rays, the Chandra X-ray Observatory that observes in X-ray frequencies, and the Spitzer Telescope that observed in infrared. Of these, only Hubble and Chandra remain active, and they're sadly old and aging, which means having to make hard decisions just like this. It's even harder to make decisions like this when no replacement is around and none is expected either. Hubble at least has the James Webb Space Telescope as its spiritual successor for observing in near-infrared wavelengths, and the upcoming Nancy Grace Roman Telescope will fill the gap for observations in optical wavelengths. But so far, no X-ray observatory is in the making to replace Chandra's capabilities. Astrophysics is not the only place at NASA that would be affected by this budget proposal, too. The request would allocate the same money for planetary science as the last fiscal year, but the Mars Sample Return Program is still not present within it, as NASA is still finalizing the program's architectural review and doesn't know how much money it'll be able to allocate for it. It's certainly not an ideal budget proposal, and we'll have to see what Congress proposes once their budget proposals go out later this year, too. Things will definitely not be easy in the coming years for the agency, so strap on in, because there's going to be a lot more budget drama in the future. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. Choo choo! Time for the lunar train news! This week we had news from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, better known as DARPA, that it has awarded a contract to Northrop Grumman to study building a lunar railroad. This is part of the agency's broader 10-year lunar architecture capability study that aims to rapidly develop foundational technology concepts for lunar exploration. Or in short, the agency that literally has advanced research projects in its name is funding studies for, you guessed it, advanced research projects. But on the moon! A potential lunar railroad would allow robotic and human missions on the surface of the moon to quickly move cargo and people from different nearby locations on the moon. This study for a lunar railroad would be looking into what would be required to build such infrastructure, from the resources required to build it, to the cost, to the logistics, and, you know, a little bit of everything, essentially. That being said, it is kind of ironic that the U.S. is about to start studies on public rail transportation on the moon, but we still haven't really nailed that on Earth yet. Though, to be fair, this is just a study. It'll be quite the trip from study to reality, but it's great to know that there's a lot more attention and ingenuity being put towards future plans on the moon than ever before. Ariane Group has begun assembly of the first flight model of the Ariane 6 rocket. The cryogenic main stage and upper stage of the rocket have been joined together at the Launcher Assembly Building in French Guiana. Inside of this building are also the main and upper stages of the Ariane 6 rocket that were used for ground testing last year. This assembly process is running in parallel to the preparation of the two solid rocket boosters to be used on this inaugural launch. The first of these has already been processed and it's ready for flight. Processing of these stages will continue over the following weeks, going through final integration at the launch pad and launching hopefully in late June of this year. Boeing has begun the fueling operations of its Starliner spacecraft ahead of the upcoming crew flight test. During this process, specially trained technicians and engineers will be conducting these operations in the hazardous processing area of the commercial crew and cargo processing facility, a process expected to take about two weeks. It'll be followed a short time later by the rollout of Starliner from this building, all the way to ULA's vertical integration facility for mating with its Atlas V rocket. So far, the launch of this mission is still on for early May of this year, so cross your fingers and maybe we'll finally see it launch for real. And now let's see what's coming up next week in spaceflight. Kicking off the week, later tonight, we'll have the launch of the Starlink Group 642 mission on Falcon 9. The four and a half hour window is set to open on March 22nd at 2355 UTC. This weekend, we may also see Roscosmos once again trying to launch the Soyuz MS-25 mission. The mission's launch was attempted on March 21st, but scrubbed about 20 seconds from liftoff due to a low voltage reading on the rocket's electrical system. If teams are able to complete a review of the rocket and its systems in time, another attempt at this launch will happen on March 23rd at 1236 UTC. Right on the heels of the launch of the CRS-30 mission from Space Launch Complex 40, another Falcon 9 is set to launch from there next week with more Starlink satellites. The four and a half hour launch window is set to open on March 25th at 2100 UTC.
And from the other side of the U.S. at Vandenberg, another Starlink mission will be taking place later in the week. The four and a half hour launch window is set to open on March 28th at 2.30 UTC. And wrapping up the week, we'll have the farewell mission of the venerable Delta IV Heavy rocket. The most metal of all rockets is set to launch its 16th and final mission on March 28th, carrying the NROL-70 payload for the National Reconnaissance Office. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. We'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.